Memory is the only lasting possession we have. I have made my life the subject of my work, using the images of home, the places I have visited, and the stars I have looked up to. I just want a reminder that I didn't imagine my experiences, says Zarina. Born into a traditional Muslim family in Aligarh, India in 1937, Zarina received a Bachelor of Science degree in mathematics from Aligarh Muslim University in 1958, and only later trained in printmaking techniques in Bangkok, Paris, and Tokyo. This university degree, alongside visits to Sultanate and Mughal architectural monuments and gardens in Agra, Fatehpur Sikri, and New Delhi, instilled in Zarina an early love of geometry, refinement, and pattern. Her father, Sheikh Abdur Rashid, was a bibliophile and a professor of medieval Indian history at Aligarh Muslim University. He had a private library in the Aligarh house, where Zarina and her siblings were permitted to play from time to time. His garden was informed by his worldly outlook, with seeds imported from abroad, and a rare surviving photograph of the house shows us a large lawn surrounded by roses, as well as fruit and medicinal trees. Zarina and her siblings lived primarily with their mother, Fahmita Begum, in the Zanana, or women's quarters, and played outside in their mother's garden, designed and planted in a more traditional manner with marigold, bougainvillea, as well as aromatic white flowers. Indeed, the fragrance of these flowers is still very dear to Zarina, and she recalls that many of the flowers came from the jasmine family, like chameli and mogra. Her favorite until today, as was her mother's, is Ratki Rani, or Queen of the Night, known to attract snakes with its beautiful scent. Zarina even talks about the sound of the blossoms opening. Zarina married diplomat Saad Hashmi in 1958 and left India to embark on a peripatetic life which would encompass cities as diverse as Bangkok, New Delhi, Paris, Bonn, Tokyo, Los Angeles, Santa Cruz, and New York. Her earliest woodblock print, titled Hawker, and this is the actual um, woodblock itself, made out of balsa wood, which she made in Bangkok, introduces us to her work. Zarina initially learned woodcut printing from a Thai professor at Shilpakorn University. Rather than drawing, Zarina was immediately drawn to carving and continued to always carve her own woodblocks. In 1963, Saad and Zarina moved to Paris, where she immediately introduced herself to renowned British printmaker and painter, Stanley William Hayter. Hayter had founded the legendary printmaking studio Atelier 17 in 1927, frequented by artists such as Picasso, Giacometti, Miro, and several other stalwarts of 20th century art. Um, and along with Zarina's work, I thought it'd be interesting to include some examples of you know, people who were either her mentors or her peers, um, who she still cites as lifelong influences. Um, you know, no artist works in any kind of artistic or intellectual silo, uh, and especially not somebody like Zarina. Um, I think as curators, we sometimes falsely include her work along other artists who were working with minimalism in India, such as Nasreen Mohammadi. But in fact, her work has nothing to do with Mohammadi's work. It had a completely different, um, a different kind of departure, which comes more from the traditions of printmaking. And uh, Stanley William Hayter was her mentor in Paris. And um, this early initiation that she had at Atelier 17 was really formative to her work. Zarina says, at Atelier 17, I learned etching and viscosity printing. But most importantly, I discovered abstraction. I credit Hater for this completely. He pushed me to go beyond the figurative. This is where I met Krishna Reddy. Um, so the photograph on the upper left shows Krishna Reddy sitting with Hater in a cafe in Paris in the 50s. And the image to the right is an early, um, very important um, intaglio print 
by Krishna Reddy from 1968, which we know was one of the most important years in, 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 20th, in the 20th century. And uh, Krishna Reddy was very um, involved with um, all of the protests that were happening um, with the student movement in Paris in the, in the late 60s. Zarina continues, my life fell apart in Paris. Saad and I were living separate lives. I drew maps and traveled through France, often on my own. I read Jean-Paul Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir, Nathalie Sorath, Alain, Rob Grier. I met the most fascinating people, André Malraux, de Beauvoir, Beckett, and Umberto Eco. I saw all the art I could, Nam Gebo, Antoine Pevsner, Malevich, Brancusi, Max Ernst, and Maria Helena Vera da Silva. I discovered Paris through art. In 1968, Saad and Zarina relocated to New Delhi, at which point she moved into a little studio of her own where she continued to live and work. This was a defining moment in her life and practice as she was coming into being as an artist in her own right. Zarina started working with found wood from the road, making relief prints through direct rubbings on the paper's surface. This is a very early example called Door from 1969 and it's a relief print from collaged wood. These compositions deal with motifs that recur throughout the artist's oeuvre, such as the concept of home, architecture and a notion of place, the jali or trellised screen, as well as geometry, abstraction, and repetition. They are also visceral and evocative works that openly communicate the artist's love of paper, as well as her intuitive understanding of the sculptural qualities of wood. In fact, Although Zarina has been celebrated as a printmaker, she is equally a sculptor, exploring every facet of her chosen medium. And I thought it would be interesting for you to see some installation views um, of the retrospective that was organized at the Hammer in Los Angeles in 2012. It then traveled to the Guggenheim, uh, and I had organized it for the museum in 2013, and then subsequently to the Art Institute of Chicago. And um, the first room includes the early woodblock for Hawker, which you can see here. And then some of these very, very early relief prints. Um, and it was a way of really introducing people um, to her interest in abstraction and geometry. And not something, this isn't something that she discovered in the 90s. Um, but for people who were less familiar with her early work, um, you know, from 68, 69, 70, um, it introduced her kind of core interests and concepts right at the start of the exhibition. Um, you know, this is a lovely one inspired by Brancusi's Kiss, her own kind of abstracted version of it. This is a view from Chicago. Just gives you a a sense of the scale of the works as well. The work has always been very intimate. Whilst in India, the artist visited local papermaking centers outside Delhi, as well as in Rajasthan, to learn about the qualities of Indian handmade paper. Um, and if you notice, um, if we just go back, I'd like you just to notice um, the captions for all of the work. Um, I wanted to give you very, very precise information because Zarina, throughout the last 50 years, has been very um, particular about the kind of paper that she uses. And in, in most cases, it's always handmade paper that she's, she has sourced from France, from Germany, from Nepal, from India. Um, and it's a really important kind of part of her decision making and, and artistic process. So Zarina says, watching paper being made and seeing the liquid paper pulp gave me all sorts of new ideas. Could I cast paper? The paper makers said it couldn't be done but I kept thinking about it. Then in her early 30s, Zarina joined the Delhi Flying Club where she learned how to glide. She states, the vocabulary of flying became part of my vocabulary. She wrote a poem which states, I tried to fly, got lost in the thermal, could never go back, having lost the place to land. Zarina continues, these four lines are my whole biography. I can't go back because there's no place to land. Where will I go? It's important to note that Zarina's parents left their Aligarh house in 1959 and moved to Pakistan. 
the trauma associated with partition, which Zarina experienced as a child, and the attendant feeling of being in permanent exile has stayed with the artist. We will, be, we will be discussing this existential late motif in greater depth in the course of the lecture. In the 1970s, Zarina continued her exploration of the surface of paper by embossing, scratching, sewing, and piercing paper. Color by now had been eliminated from her practice, and this series of work was made entirely on white paper. Can you see the scratches? It's a very difficult image to actually see, but um, it's called fence, and, uh, and you can see the kind of scratching that's happening on the surface of the paper. So this is the series that she started in the, in the mid-70s. Paper is an organic material, almost like human skin. You can scratch it, you can mold it, it even ages, says Zarina. On a brief visit to New York in 1973, Zarina visited the retrospective of German-American artist Eva Hesse at the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum. She says, I had never seen a show so luminous. I liked the transparency in her work, and her cords and knots were like tangled lifelines. I also responded to the repetition of shapes. I too was very involved with the repetition of forms. According to Guggenheim curator Nancy Spector, artists working in the late 1960s were finding inspiration in the human body, random occurrence, the process of improvisation, and the liberating qualities of non-traditional materials such as industrial felt, molten lead, wax, and rubber. These artists mined a new aesthetic sensibility variously known as anti-form, post-minimalism, or process art. During her brief career, Eva Hesse contributed to this radical undermining of artistic convention with her abstract yet sensual sculptural works. Zarina still has the catalog from this exhibition in her, in her studio in New York. Um, and this is um, an example of the work that's in the Guggenheim's collection, but I looked up um, archival images of the retrospective from 1973, and this work was included in the retrospective. So it's a real example of something that she saw at the time. Zarina received a Japan Foundation grant in 1974 and moved to Tokyo. She contacted French Canadian priest, Father Gaston Petit, who proceeded to employ her to make prints. Alongside working for Father Petit, Zarina made ends meet by working as an apprentice at the Toshi Yoshida studio, where she was able to learn about Japanese woodblock printing. After a brief stint in Los Angeles, Zarina moved to New York in 1976, where she was introduced by Krishna Reddy to legendary African-American artist, teacher, and printmaker Robert or Bob Blackburn, founder of the printmaking workshop. Blackburn worked with lithography, woodcuts, monotypes, and intaglio prints. Um, so that's Bob Blackburn up here in his studio. And that's an example of one of his woodcut prints. This was the beginning of forming a community of like-minded artists for herself in the city. Unfortunately, in 1977, Saad Hashmi suddenly passed away. Zarina says, it was a difficult time in my life. I had very little money, was depressed, and never wanted to leave my house. I felt eaten away. I took a needle to paper and pierced it repeatedly. For months I stayed home, made my pin drawings, and thought about my life. Um, these are a very well-known series that some of you might have seen in person. Again, they translate quite poorly as images, but they're incredibly sensual and visceral works. Um, and quite often, on, on the back of the um, works on paper, you might find a pencil grid. Um, and, and Zarina said she was very interested in looking at the modern as a grid as a, as a point of departure, then finding her own way, her own methodology, her own kind of answer to that rigid hierarchy and, and creating a more sensual and perhaps more feminine response um, to that kind of received um, doctrine. What eventually drew Zarina out of her depression, as well as her home, was New York itself and Zarina's close friendships. 
One such formative friendship was with Cuban-American artist Anna Mendieta, who moved to New York in 1978 and had a solo exhibition of her photographs at the progressive all-female cooperative space AIR Gallery the following year. Um, so this is probably the best known series from Mendieta's practice, the Silhouetta series. Um, and this photograph, again, um, was part of the AIR show in um, 1979. Together with Mendieta, Zarina curated an exhibition at AIR titled Dialectics of Isolation, an exhibition of third world women artists in the United States. Zarina became greatly involved with the feminist movement and joined the faculty of the New York Feminist Art Institute, founded in 1979 by women artists and educators. She also became a member of the Heresies Collective, founded in 1976 as a discursive platform for feminism, politics, and art. The collective primarily oversaw the work of publishing their journal, Heresies, a feminist publication on art and politics, amongst other activities in the cities. In the city. In 1979, Zarina helped publish an important issue as part of Heresies titled Third World Women, The Politics of Being Other. She says, working on this publication was an education on the issues faced by African Americans at that point. The unrest of the civil rights movement wasn't far behind us, and it was a learning experience to work alongside African American, Latino, and Caribbean artists. It was a time defined by women artists by the likes of Louise Bourgeois, Harmony Hammond, Nancy Spiro, Mae Stevens, and many others. That's just another view of the pin drawings. Starting in the early 1980s, Zarina revisited her idea of casting paper using special plexiglass, plexiglass molds in order to make sculptural works. The ensuing body of work is the most colorful in her practice and includes an admixture of natural pigments and liquid paper pulp. This is also the time when Zarina first started to explore the notion of home. Alongside the cast paper works, which include both architectural elements as well as flora and fauna drawn from the natural world, Zarina embarked on a series of cast bronzes inspired by her elder sister Rani's garden in Pakistan. You know, it was important to also include some less well-known work. Um, I think we all are more familiar perhaps with the pin drawings or with her uh, series of, um, you know, large woodblock prints. But these works from the 80s are um, somewhat forgotten because they've been dispersed into private collections. But I think it was really important to include them. Again, just to reiterate the fact that she isn't just a printmaker. She's also very much a sculptor. Um, and again, the scale is very, very important. Um, this is uh, an installation of the bronze works um, that we internally called Rani's Garden when we were mapping out the retrospective in New York. Um, and I think we were the only venue to show it um, in its full, you know, the idea of this enclosure or a private garden. Um, there were some elements that were included in, at the Hammer in Los Angeles. You know, everything that she's ever made has always been done by herself. It's always been very in intimate. It's always been related to what she can cope through her own body and through her own hands. So there's an intimacy that runs throughout, throughout her practice. Um, this is an installation view at the Art Institute of Chicago. Just to show you different permutations of what curators do with an artist's work. Between 1992 and 1997, Zarina taught printmaking at the University of California at Santa Cruz, while also continuing her studio practice in New York. This constant journey across the United States, as well as visits to Karachi to see her siblings and parents, led to works such as Crawling House. From 1994, one of the few sculptural installations in Zarina's practice and an important work in her oeuvre. With its inherent precariousness, each home literally hangs from a pin on the wall. And references to nomadism and, mig and migration, the work embodies both a sense of belonging as well as dislocation. There's such an inherent simplicity to all of it. That's what a great artist can do. <clears throat> 
In the portfolio of prints, Homes I Made, A Life in Nine Lines from 1997, Zarina provides us with an autobiographical roadmap through her life by creating essentialized floor plans of the spaces she has inhabited since first leaving India in 1958. Whereas Bangkok was her first home, Paris was where she watched the Seine flow by and waited for him to come home. Santa Cruz was a horizontal blue line, and New York is described by Zarina as a space to hide forever. Um, I also thought you'd appreciate actually seeing her studio. Um, this is the space that she has lived in and worked in since first moving to New York in 1976. So she's been there for over 40 years. Um, very Spartan, like the rest of her. Um, this is from a few years ago, but it looks pretty much the same now. The artist has often turned to Urdu poetry and literature since the 18th century by Bahadur Shah Zafar, Mirza Ghalib, Muhammad Iqbal, and Fez Ahmad Fez to formulate deep philosophical ruminations about life, time, travel, and the soul. She states, poetry was always a part of our life. In Indian and Islamic tradition, you learn by memorizing things, and the measure of an educated person is determined, determined by how many poems you can recite. In 1998, Zarina fought and won an ugly legal battle for the right, for the right to continue to live in her studio in Manhattan. The ensuing feeling of vulnerability catalyzed a portfolio of 36 woodcut prints titled Home is a Foreign Place, which is a magnum opus in her oeuvre. Zarina says, I made a list of Urdu words that embodied home for me. Threshold, door, entrance, courtyard. In Pakistan, I had a calligrapher write out each word in Nastalik script. In New York, I developed an image to accompany each word. So the word comes first, then the image. Language ties my work together. Urdu is home. Um, so this is one of the works in Home is a Foreign Place called Despair. And here's the, the Urdu word um, accompanied by its image. And I thought it would be fun for you to see, um, again, the relationships that uh, inspired Zarina, uh, especially her close friendship with Anna Mendiata, who, as many of you know, um, died very young, tragically. She um, either was pushed off or fell off her apartment building in Manhattan. The case is still unknown. Um, and this is a very important performance that she did in the mid-'70s called Body Tracks. Um, and Zarina says that that's really what she had in mind when she did this particular print called Despair. So I thought it would be quite nice for you to hear the 36 words. Home, threshold, door, entrance, courtyard. Wall, sky, earth, sun, moon, stars, axis, morning, dawn, dew, afternoon, stillness, hot breeze, evening, shadows, clouds, dust storm, rain, fragrance, night, darkness, despair, country, dust, language, journey, road, destination, distance, time, border. Um, another example called destination. And again, just a reminder of Zarina's time in Paris and what she would have seen there, including Brancusi's studio, which is now part of the Pompidou Center in Paris. And of course, um, his various renditions um, of the endless column and her own sort of interpretation or reinterpretation of that, of that image. Border. It is interesting to note here that while the portfolio begins with an image of Zarina's childhood home in Aligarh and a gentle invitation to enter its rooms, that it ends with an image of the border, of being locked out, unable to pass through. The woodcut dividing line from 2001 is an iconic work that sublimates Zarina's internalization of the partition. She recalls when, as a 10-year-old child, she and her mother, an elder sister, Rani, were sent to a refugee camp in Delhi for a few months 
before traveling onwards to Karachi. After attending a local school for a while in Karachi, Zarina made her way back to Aligarh under her father's escort. She says, These memories have stayed with me and formed how I think about a lot of things. Fear, separation, migration, the people you know or think you know, your friends and neighbors. I often think about the refugees that were coming from Pakistan or going to Pakistan. Trains would pull into the station and everyone on board had been killed. Families were split, homes destroyed, the fabric of life for millions of people was permanently altered. All this for a new border, this dividing line. Um, and while I was doing the research for this lecture, I came across this sort of uh, mirror work from 2013 called Abyss. Um, and I think, again, it just starts to show you how Zarina will work with a certain idea or an image or an idiom or a metaphor um, for either various years or various decades or over time. She will always come back to a, an old woodcut or an old idea and find a new way of um, reformulating that, that, that concern or that question or that idea of the border or the line. Um, and here you have Abyss. The early years of the new millennium were a turning point in Zarina's life and practice as she honed her political consciousness through art. After the events of 9-11, Zarina states, ethnic conflict changed my life. As the years passed, I found myself witnessing conflicts waged against Muslim communities around the world. Her poignant series, These Cities Blotted Into the Wilderness, Adrian Rich After Ghalib, from 2003, includes essentialized maps of Ahmedabad, Baghdad, Beirut, Grozny, Janine, Kabul, New York, Sarajevo, Sre Srebrenica, I always have a hard time pronouncing that, and sites of modern warfare, terror, and mass civilian death. I think you can see you know, the mass graves here and her own way of mapping that. Letters from Home from 2004 are based on letters written by Zarina's sister Rani, which were never posted to her in New York. They speak of the death of Zarina's parents, as well as of her eldest sister, Saida. They speak of Rani having to sell her house in Karachi after having lived there for 32 years. They speak of the separation between two beloved sisters and of Zarina's solitary existence in New York. They speak of family libraries and gardens and cherished memories. They speak of erasure and closure. This is a map of... Um, the hall where her father taught at Aligarh Muslim University with one of Rani's letters. This is about the death of her mother. And this is of her sister thinking of her living alone in New York for 40 years and what that, how that would have impacted her psychologically. This is her trying to erase all of it. The works Noor, Divine Light and Blinding Light from 2008 and 2010, as well as Zarina's tasbis from the same period, invite us into a spiritual realm. Using 22 karat gold leaf to create a resplendent surface, these works allude to the notion of home as ultimately residing in the blinding light of the creator. This is an installation view of blinding light at the Guggenheim. Probably the largest format work that Zarina has made in paper. This is one of her tasbis. The tasbis or prayer beads also necessitate counting and quiet contemplation. Here, repetition takes on transcendental qualities. Zarina also interweaves the notion of home as residing within this very meditation as she carves each bead in the shape of a house. This is the one where every bead is actually a sandalwood house that's been strung together in the form of a tasbi. Made of fragranced sandalwood. In one tasbi, covered with black sumi ink and gold leaf, Zarina also plays with the idea of mapping and of, and of globes, as the abstract forms resemble atlases. Please. The ongoing series, The 10,000 Things. Okay, 
here we go. The ongoing series, The 10,000 Things, which Zarina commenced in 2009, which we showed here in this format at the Guggenheim, are inspired by Marcel Duchamp and his Boite en Valise, containing miniature replicas of finished work, as well as photographic reproductions. And that's one of the examples of the box in a suitcase. The title is taken from the celebrated Tang Dynasty poet, Sen Shen. When the 10,000 things have been seen in their unity, we return to the beginning and remain where we have always been. Zarina uses old photographs and cuts, recycles, and reassembles old woodcuts to create abstracted, portable vignettes from her life and practice. The series shows her interest in archiving her own work, as well as her love of books, since the final size of the folios is the size of a paperback. She says that she would, have, that she would love to see them all published as a book. For Zarina, states art critic Karen Rosenberg, paper is sculpture, poetry, currency, and above all, a kind of permanent home for a nomadic spirit. Taking this nomadism as a point of inspiration and departure, the first iteration of the 10,000 things was shown in this kind of circular format. Um, and each one of these is part of the 10,000 things. Let me just show you some more. Um, this is the second set in the same series from 2011 to 2014. And I think I have some close-ups to show you, yeah. Um, you know, a miniaturized house, shadows on her work table, and a, and a tasbi. The constellation, which goes back to homes of foreign place, as well as the idea of ascending to the blinding light, or noor, done in gold leaf. The sculptural installation Descending Darkness from 2014 may be seen as the mirror piece to early works such as Noor, Divine Light, and Blinding Light. Here, Zarina utilizes black marble for the hanging bulbs, which relates to her use of Sumi ink for her works on paper. She says, I've been using Sumi ink to dye my paper. It's a transformative liquid. It seeps into every fiber of my paper, swallowing all color with its deep black darkness. Zarina's somber exhibition at Loring Augustine Gallery reflects her state of mind and her thoughts on contemporary civic life. Um, and some installation views from her exhibition. It has never been enough for her to only be seen or reckoned with as an artist. What is at stake and far more important is an individual's humanity, values, and spiritual life and the ethics by which one conducts one's life. Recent works on the global refugee crisis and the attendant issues of migration, danger, loss of life, and familial separation point to Zarina's sensitive understanding of the precariousness of life and of her own mortality. She says, when I lay in bed at night, I think about the 10-year-old Rohingya children fleeing Myanmar and the 10-year-old Syrian children climbing into boats. I can't join the resistance, but I protest through my work, memorializing destroyed cities and communities. I'd like to end the lecture with two works from the artist's latest series of works titled No Escape from 2015, which further elucidate Zarina's fears and concerns about global geopolitics, warfare, and technologies of surveillance. Using recycled woodblock prints Woodblock prints drenched in black sumi ink, Zarina's intricate and suffocating webs are places of no escape and trenchant reminders of the world's escalating weaponization, both physical and digital. Thank you. So, um, if there are any questions now, we have lots of time, so just raise your hands and I'll just... Uh, that comprehensive. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you. I wanted to try to show you things that are not normally seen. No, the first works are always the, the, the relief prints. Um, sorry. <clears throat> the garden is, is later. That's Rani's garden. But the, if you remember the first um, woodblocks from the 68, 69 are actually sculptural because she's using wood that she finds right outside the studio in Delhi. And she's using them to make direct prints on the paper. Um, so they're not carved. They're, they're using found sculptures or found pieces of wood, and you're making direct prints. So there's a sculptural quality already, but she's working in two dimensions. She's working with paper. It might make sense to just escape it and go back to the early work. Can we just close it and go back? I mean, I guess the first sculptural works are really the cast paper sculptures. Uh, she shows with Renu Modi, uh, which is a gallery espace in Delhi. So she's had quite a few exhibitions there. Um, Pakistan's a sore topic. Um, she says that she feels exiled from everywhere um, because she needs a visa to come into India because she has a US passport. Um, she made a comment once where she was too Muslim to come to India, too Muslim to be in the United States, and yet too Indian to be in Pakistan. <laughs> and. Uh, and she said it's a very difficult situation to be in. Um, and it's something that she speaks about quite emotionally when you talk to her about it. Um, any other questions? Thank you for this. Uh, oh, I, was, thank you. I was just wondering, uh, you know, when you, you mentioned that there was a grid that she Behind made, the pin drawings. Yeah, when she's talking of modernity, and it struck me that those seem to also play a lot with repetition. Yes. And I was wondering if uh, she says something about the idea of repetition, uh, not just in terms of a meditative practice, but maybe, I mean, is there any relation she sees uh, with modernities? You know, when she was working on the pin drawings, remember I mentioned that her husband died in 77. And those first years when she was making the pin drawings were actually some of the most difficult years of her life. It's extraordinary that one of the most beautiful series, which are the pin drawings, were created at a time of incredible loss and self-doubt. Uh, so for her, it wasn't, she, and this is the thing that happens to a lot of artists in retrospect. We ascribe art historical models to them. We say they're abstract. We say that they're minimal. We say that they're process art, they're anti-form, they're all of this. but. She was never somebody who followed art history. Um, her relationships really came through individual artists and the exhibitions she saw, the books that she read, the places that she traveled, the, pe the friendships that she had. Um, so for her, repetition wasn't about the canon of minimalism or the canon of abstraction. It was just her way of dealing with her own sorrow. Uh, it's a private, intimate practice of sitting at home and doing this kind of repetitive action to probably blot out some of the emotions that she's feeling. Um, all of these things have happened to her subsequently. We've tried to pigeonhole her into all of these different categories. She says, you've called me a feminist, you've called me Muslim, you've called me South Asian, you've called me a woman, you've called me a minimalist, you've called me an abstractionist, but I'm none of these. That's very so important. Just to add on to what you say yes. about Thank you. Yeah. No, I don't. 20, 20 Thank you for letting me know. I don't know about this one. It used to be as fast for liquid system And it's called the line? The line I cannot erase. So I'm saying on the dividing line. On the dividing line. line. But done as a pin drawing. It's the most, it's, it's the most recent and a very strong take, and also on the white with black, it's black with white. It's two different techniques. Oh, thank you. I mean, the line, right? It comes through calligraphy. It comes through the woodblock print. It comes through how you gouge something. It comes in abstraction. It comes in geometry. It comes in architecture. It comes in mathematics. Um, it comes through the found wood. Um, you could do a whole study of just her understanding of the line. So the dividing line, the border, map making, 
There's a whole series that she did of the river in Delhi, how she creates maps, how she creates kind of these aerial views of the different places that have meant something to her. But with Zarina, it's always from her own lived experience. This isn't, this isn't something that she's just reading about in the newspaper, or even though she's an avid follower of politics, um, I remember all the times I visited her in New York, she had an opinion about something or the other. She was constantly watching television. She had four Macintoshes, uh, constantly Googling you know, contemporary politics, somebody who was very interested in what was happening around her, but had her own voice and her own individual, nuanced, intimate way of processing all of it through her own hand and her own eye and her own body and what she was able to do through her own table in that studio. Thank you. Um, if any of her work has some sort of, I mean, if she's indulged in any work with a patron or with a client or, sorry, or is this, um, I, yeah, commissioned work or is this all just a series works. and uh, no. no, no, that's not the method. Okay, um, so. it's never been by invitation. Yeah, uh, this is just work that has been produced on a very kind of consistent basis from her studio. Of, we saw some of the work that be, had been done in Delhi. Um, and then since 1976, she's really just been working and living in that studio in Manhattan. Um, but it's never been a commission in response to an invitation. It's always been s ideas and subjects and concerns and questions and propositions that were inherently and deeply and ideologically rooted to her own practice. So, I mean, she started with like just paper. And yes. Just, like analyzing it. Yeah, from sure. Her. And then she moves into, in the end, to, you know, um, 22 karat gold and stuff like that. So I was just wondering that kind of a process. But the gold, is, the gold leaf is still used on paper. So yeah, for her, the gold, that, but, the gold uh, is just a kind of abstracted way of thinking about the divine, of thinking about Noor, of thinking about her own mortality and how her own soul is going to merge with that blinding light. So yeah. she talks about spirituality, not just in Islam and with Sufism, but also in Western traditions and Catholicism and Hinduism. Um, she's very, very well read. And um, for her, the, the use of the gold leaf is just an invitation to us to think about the spiritual realm. Uh, but again, through this abstracted form, you know, through this incredibly pared down form. Uh, but paper has really been her, her mainstay right from the first woodblock from 1961, right till, you know, even work that she's producing now. No, I, I remember you were saying something in the middle where she said that, um, you know, I'm, I, I don't have money and uh, pin drawings. Is, I think that was the stage yeah. where... Yeah. In the so 70s. I was wondering how that kind of translate. I mean, you know, to experiment with like sculptural objects like or you don't have a... But the sculptural how? works are again done in very, I mean, the the crawling houses are made out of tin. I mean, it's always, you know, materials that were quite, quite you know, inexpensive. Uh, accessible and inexpensive. Yes. Okay. You know, and again, your, the wood block is done in a series. It's yeah. always a series of 10 or 15 or 25. Um, there was always a limited means in terms of materiality. It's only when she was able to get gallery representation through Espas and also through Loring Augustine that she was able to start to work with gold leaf and obsidian so that was the only, uh, and materials source, like basically. that. Absolutely. But again, nothing ever ostentatious because yeah. along with working with gold leaf and obsidian, she was also still using her old wood blocks, you know, discarded prints. If you saw, remember her studio, she had these flats, she has these beautiful archival boxes, everything is archived. Um, you know, the, there are wood block prints from the 70s, 80s, 90s that she never threw away, but through the collaging and the assembling and the cutting and the interweaving, she, u she uses them again. And it's a way of looking back at those old images and narratives and reformulating them, asking new questions, creating new images. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry. Yes. Hello. I really enjoyed that. Um, Thank you. But I actually have a question to you about the curatorial process. OK. Um, I, I don't know much about it. So how do, do you usually take your, like an artist or an idea or a theme to the museum? Or do you get um, maybe commissioned by a museum to bring artists in? How does it work? Okay. 
Um, gosh, that's a really... I know. For most people here, it must be like a stupid question. No, it's not. A, nothing is ever <laughs> a stupid question. I don't even believe in that premise, first of all. Um, because curatorial studies are still very nascent in India, so you have a right to ask me this question. Um, so I'll just tell you with the case of, uh, I'll just give you a bit of history. So Anish Kapoor was the first artist I worked with at the Guggenheim, and that was a major commission. Um, and that was being spons sponsored by Deutsche Bank. So Deutsche Bank and the Guggenheim had a 15-year relationship. And um, every few years, we had the money from the bank to create a new work of art that would either go to Deutsche Bank or come to the Guggenheim's permanent collection. Um, and in that scenario, you, you, you choose the artist that, whose work you really want in the collection. You go to them, you invite them, they create several propositions, you choose one of them, and then you actually spend the next three years making them. You make the work, you exhibit it, you write about it, you contextualize it. Uh, in the case with Zarina, um, I was very privileged to meet her the year I moved to New York in 2001 because of my mother. Zarina had been on an academic panel um, for South Asian scholars. Um, and it was the first time that contemporary artists had been invited to this because it was usually people who are working with the pre-modern. And, um, you know, the, the, the 10 years that I lived in New York were changed because of my relationship with Zarina Hashmi. And um, at the time that I met her, she had a very close coterie of artists and filmmakers and critics who really venerated her and loved her, people like Krishna Reddy and Ram Rahman and Naveena Haider, who continued to be her friends. But she wasn't really known in the art world in general. And it was a pity because you have so many great artists who are living in your own city who go completely under-recognized. As soon as I joined the Guggenheim in 2007, I was really keen to try to rectify that. And the first thing we did was acquire 20 of the pin drawings that I had seen with her. And I really felt that they needed to be in a major museum collection. And I promised her that at one point I would try to help her. And I made a curatorial proposition to the museum, was able to convince them, and then we acquired the works for the collection. And so when it came time to, to do the retrospective, we knew that we had the pin drawings as a beautiful stage to finally uh, unveil them to the public. Um, but she was very lucky that she had three curators, one at the Hammer, one at the Guggenheim, and one at the Chicago, who had followed her practice for a very long time and were all keen to work with her. And therefore, you had three institutions that shared the retrospective as a touring retrospective. So again, it's an artist that you really believe in. It's not, you, you believe in them for five years, 10 years, 15 years sometimes. You find the right occasion to collaborate with them because you really respect them and honor them and, and learn something from them. Um, so we were able to acquire the work first and then you know, four years later do the retrospective. So every um, situation is different. Um, when I did the Gaitonde retrospective, it really came as an academic idea. Um, you know, he was somebody that we all knew, yet there was no scholarship on him. His work had never really been seen as, as a retrospective. There had been no conservation done on his work. There was nothing known about his life. So I went to the Guggenheim with this idea of showing this really important artist from South Asia who was a great protagonist and a great teacher and a great you know, mentor. But we didn't know anything about his exhibition history, his biography, his bibliography, anything about his life. His work had never been written about in any kind of art historical way. Um, and I convinced the museum to do it. And it was a very important show at the Guggenheim, which um, changed the museum in some ways because they were no longer just a Western institution. They were looking at global art and looking at non-Western art on the same footing as any kind of Western modernist. So I think in every situation, it's, it, 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 there's a different approach or a different methodology, but you just have to get it done. You have to be very persistent. Um, and some of these relationships, they take 5, 10, 15 years to actually manifest. But you have to just do it. Um, and hopefully you still have these friendships with the artists and you continue to serve, with, serve them in different ways, like this lecture. Oh, and I also did a project um, called Being Singular Plural, which was looking at experimental sound and moving, images, moving image practices from across, across South Asia. Um, you might know the work of Amar Kanwar, you might know the work of Design Machine Collective, you might know the work of Shimona Goel. They're all Kabir Mohanty, people who had been trained as incredible filmmakers. But again, 
even though Amar has been in four consecutive documentaries, his work really hadn't been written about or seen enough in New York. Um, and again, over a period of six years, I was able to collaborate with them, acquire a lot of the work for the Guggenheim's permanent collection, and then show their work um, both in Berlin and in New York. And again, I'm still friends with all of them. So they might invite me to write a catalog essay for them. They, we might work together in a different way. I might help them to still get their work into different museum collections. Um, these are not relationships that die with that project coming to an end. They continue because they matter to you. Okay, I hope that helps. So, I have a question. Yeah. I, it was a really enjoyable presentation. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that Zarina works very intimately with her body. She makes things that she can make. She doesn't have a team, you know, erecting monumental. Yeah. And then she embarks on this work, 10,000 things. Yeah. So I'm just trying to understand, uh, is it like a, is she archiving or ma mapping the trajectory of her practice over 40 years in that piece? Yes, or? it is, actually, because a lot of them um, are all photographs of the family. I'll give you some examples. Some of them are miniaturized versions of the tasbis or the folding houses or the refugee camps. Other ones are, you know, again, the, the discarded what we would think of as discarded woodcuts, you know, woodblock prints, that she's reusing and creating, you know, new weavings or new kind of drawings. Um, so it's a way of her to, to think about her own life. Um, but again, very inspired by Duchamp and the idea of an artist creating miniature replicas and photographic reproductions of their own work and creating these kind of portable museums. You might think of it close to like what Dainita does. Um, you know, creating a museum through the 10,000 things. And she actually wants to make the 10,000 things. Right now, there aren't 10,000 no, things. But oh. it's metaphorical also. It's, the, it's an idea of counting and looking back at one's own life. I mean, when we did the retrospective, you know, it's a very kind of cliched press question. So, Zarina, how do you feel about the show? You must be very proud. And she said that I'm actually extremely fearful because I've never seen 50 years of my own life presented in a single show. And I, I don't know how to deal with it. Um, so a retrospective ex exhibition is not straightforward for the artist. I mean, Navjot is here with us. You know, she's just got her show at NGMA. It's a vexed emotional space for an artist. It's not straightforward. We, we think of, we write of it in very kind of linear, chronological ways, but for an artist, to be able to reckon with such a long practice, you know, with earlier work, with more recent work, uh, it, it takes them time to live with their own work. Um, so she visited the show in all three venues very often um, so that she could just try to get some of her own understanding about her work. She had never seen so much altogether. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, though they are completely different from each other, Nasreen, Mamadi, and uh, Zarina, what is it that makes people draw patterns between them? I think it's quite simplistic, um, the fact that they were both women artists. The idea, the question is about Nasreen, Mohammadi, and Zarina. Um, the fact that they were both South Asian women artists, and some of the few that, you know, veered away from figuration and storytelling and narrativity and went into the non-figurative or the abstract space. Um, and Zarina knew Nasreen Mohamadi. Uh, she was an artist that she was familiar with. But Zarina's entire inspiration came from the history of printmaking. You know, whether it was Japanese woodblock prints or whether it was Atelier 17 or her very, very close friendship with Krishna Reddy and all of his innovations with simultaneous uh, intaglio printing. So her community of artists was A, the printmakers, or the artists that were really gathering around the feminist movement, um, like Louise Bourgeois and Anna <coughs> Mendieta in New York in the 70s and the early 80s. Um, and Nasreen Mohammadi has nothing to do with these. Um, so I think very sort of <coughs> simplistic visual uh, parallels have been drawn between the practices, but they're very reductive and they're art historically completely incorrect. Yeah. Yeah. And 
I only realized now when I chatted briefly that it was one of the very few shows ahead of South Asian art at the Guggenheim. Uh, from what you described earlier, that a lot of the time, in a lot of instances, they had actually acquired the art and then they exhibited it. Yeah. Which for me, because I'm also curated in a different space in film, it's a whole other ball game because it involves finances and convincing people at other levers of power. Uh, is it usually is it easier for you for them to just have a curated effect and allow you the space to do it? I thought the acquisition of other number, and because I struggle with the same things, and also Uh, is it, I mean, other than the cost, so isn't people who are big have somebody they respect do it instead of necessarily okay. acquiring? Of course, it's fantastic for the artist to have a work of mine. So, um, <laughs> okay. um, I'll do talk about acquisitions first. It was very important for me that in those years that we were working on the Asian art program, that we didn't just do exhibitions because they come and go but that we had to make an impact on the legacy of the Guggenheim. And the only way you really change an institution is through its collection. So part of my brief, or let's say, head banging, um, you know, hitting over the head to all of the senior curators was we need to devise exhibitions which are also allowing us to commission work or co-commission work. And this is very unusual in a museum. This is something that biennales do. Um, and we had an academic council called the Asian Art Council, and Jack Pasekian, who's this controversial but very venerated curator from, uh, the, from Jerusalem and Sharjah, said, but you guys are so passive. You only do exhibitions. You never really spawn new work and new ideas and new commissions like Sharjah. And I thought, OK, that's a great challenge. You've just thrown down the gauntlet. I'm actually commissioning everything. So um, it's very difficult. It doesn't happen that often. Um, you know, Shri and Priya, who are both leaders here, um, will tell you that to actually commission work, acquire them, and then show them and document them is almost unheard of. Um, I wouldn't do it again. It almost killed me. But the fact is that today the Guggenheim has work by all of these artists. And the reason that they show very little about South Asia is that South Asia is a very young field. Um, we have great scholarship on the pre-modern, but we have very little scholarship on the modern, and that's still true. Um, people like Gaitonde, people like K.G. Subramanian, people like Nandalal Bose, people, I mean, you're talking about the earlier generation, don't forget about the contemporary, still don't have monographs on their practices. Um, you know, but the, the galleries are trying to do this, the museums are trying to do this, but there's a vast amount of scholarship that still has to be done. Um, and, you know, it's going to take everyone in this room, young critics, young curators, young writers to really start to, you know, chip away at that. Um, my work at the Guggenheim was the first time that they showed South Asian art, but there's a commitment now, you know, to show non-Western art, to show art from Asia, and it's now become part of the museum's mission. This is not something that's going to die just because I've left. Um, but at the time, you know, the idea of South Asia was Anish Kapoor. The idea of South Asia was Anish Kapoor. That's where the knowledge started and ended. And it's nothing related to what we do. Um, so being singular plural, Zarina Hashmi, um, Gaitonde, these were very important first steps, not just for the Guggenheim, but also for our field. Um, and since then, you've had, you know, exhibitions happening all over. very senior um, in England, in London, telling me, why would an Indian do this? You know, so I, for me, it's interesting to ask you this question, whether a white curatorial community sees that they are the authority of everything in the world, including Oriental or Indian or Asian art, and a kind of patronizing, oh yeah, we'll also let some brown guys do some stuff. I'm curious whether these kind of undercurrents uh, <laughs> exist in the artistic sphere because I experienced it so, in such a brittle man, I was astonished uh, that an Indian curating Indian films would be seen as so contemptuously. Yeah. I said, whoa. <laughs> well, I think, the, I think the field has changed. Um, yeah, we're just talking about the, the lack of visibility of South Asian curators internationally. Um, but, you know, 
I did these projects almost 10 years ago, and at the time, I was the only brown person in the room. Uh, in fact, I was the only brown person in an institution of 350 white people. Um, and as my mother knows, I wore a sari to every single opening. But yes, you do feel, um, but then you, 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 you take the responsibility even stronger. You know, you, you take it on, you take it on board. But the field has changed. You've got positions now that have opened up in various parts of the world. Um, you've got gallerists and biennials and artists and writers and young curators and critics working all over the world. Um, so it's shifted. You know, it's, it's more taken for granted now. It's part of the mainstream. Um, I think these titles are still ridiculous. You know, the, the, the curator of Middle Eastern art or the curator of South Asian art, these titles shouldn't exist. We should just be curators of international art or contemporary art. So the shift has happened. It's a field. Uh, Asian art is older than South Asian art. Asian art has been documented and, and exhibited, especially in places like Fukuoka and Queensland for the last 25, 30 years. So it's happened in the region for longer than it's happened in the West. We just don't look at Australia or, or Japan, but in fact, we have to, because these institutions have been collecting from Pan-Asia for much longer than the Guggenheims and the MoMAs and the Mets. Um, but the Western institutions now are realizing that for them to really be considered global, they need to re-educate themselves, that they are the ones who are ignorant, not us. And this has taken time, it's taken 10, 15 years, but the press is writing about it differently, the artists think of them differently, the museums think of themselves differently, and it's everyone in this room who has a part to play in it. You know, institutions <laughs> like this. Yeah. I think that's it, yeah, thanks. Thank you so much. No, Please welcome. join me in thanking Sunday.